Hello everyone and welcome to the History Hotline, the hottest line for all things black history and beyond. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 53 of the History Hotline. My name is Deanna Lynn Cook and I'm your host today. If this is the first time you're listening, then welcome. I hope you enjoy this episode and if it's not, then thank you so much for coming back. Today's episode is called The Battle of Lewisham, and that's because it's about the Battle of Lewisham. Um, Battle is an interesting word. It's what it's known as historically, but I wouldn't say battle is a word I would necessarily use um, to describe what happened in Lewisham on the 13th of August 1977. Today we will be thinking about the National Front, um, racism, fascism and anti-racism and anti-fascism. Um, and what that looked like in South East London in 1977. Um, we've not done too much history of the 70s. I feel like a lot of the things have been like early 80s, mid 80s or like 50s, 60s. So it's interesting to, you know, have a look at how these racial tensions um, were continuing to boil and simmer and come to a point of battle shall we say in 1977 so I really hope you enjoyed this episode it's been one on my list for a really long time I've really wanted to do an episode about this um and I had a great time actually researching for this episode I learned a lot um especially because I feel like that part of southeast London I actually know somewhat well so I could visualize it which is always really cool um so yeah if you're from southeast London then shout out to you Maybe you can picture how this all panned out, even though you probably, you might not have known what um, Lewisham, Deptford, New Cross, New Cross Gate, that kind of size, looked like in the 70s. But still, um, picture it today and, and think about how So, Battle of Lewisham, 13th of August 1977. South East London becomes a very intense hub of violent political activity by neo-nazis the national front um who are led by john tyndall um at the point of kind of the mid 1970s um there's a breakaway faction by john kingsley reed um and then you know by 1977 the kind of main and big name we have when we think about the national front um, is the organiser Martin Webster, who, and I will quote, said, We believe that the multiracial society is wrong, is evil, and we want to destroy it. So he was all about, you know, make Britain white again, keep Britain white, all of those kinds of slogans, you know, know anyone that isn't white in this country, um, and especially not in, in South East London and this area of Lewisham. Deptford and New Cross, um, that is kind of very much the centre of this protest um, that comes about. Now, I wanted to delve a little bit deeper into the National Front because I think they're kind of a, um, I don't even know if I want to call them an organisation, they're a group of people that we just brush off as like, you know, working class, uneducated, racist people who are a thing of the past and rear their ugly heads every now and again. But really, we shouldn't be too worried about them. And whilst that is true, because I think systemic racism and the racism meted out by the state and the government is very important. And I think probably should take up more of our time in kind of dismantling and thinking about that. Um, groups like the National Front are just as as violent um, physically and, you know, working within systems because you wouldn't really know, I would say, in the National Front who like what they do in their day jobs do you know what I mean like it's kind of like the KKK like the National Front didn't wear hoods or anything like that but um the KKK for all you know could be your teacher they could be your police officer most likely um they could be your doctor they could be anything in the day in the light of day um and it's the same with the National Front these ideologies this view that Britain should not be a multiracial society um it's evil and wrong you know they are against any kind of um, mixing of different cultures, any acceptance of different cultures, races, religions in Britain. Um, and that is a very violent ideology um, to live out because it directly threatens, you know, these people, or by these people I mean all the immigrant groups that were settling in South East London um, at the time. It threatens their very way of living. It thre- So I've actually got some clips today 
Um, these are from the London Local Archives, I think it's called. Um, and I will link the video in the show notes because it's a good video, quite long. Um, but I did take some clips from it. And I really hope that this video is not pulled, this podcast, sorry, is not pulled for copyright. My number one fear in this life is being pulled for copyright. But I'm hoping this will be fine and the clips I've used are, are really small. Um, it's from the London Community Video Archives, um, just to get that right. And yeah, it's the video called August 13th, What Happened? So this first video is from coordinator Martin Westminster of the National Front. Um, and just his views, I guess, of... What the National Front released. Martin Webster, the National Front's activities organiser, recently said, Where we are strong, we are putting a lot of psychological pressure on immigrants. We are telling them we do not feel they should be here. And he added, Yes, we are a racialist party and we are respectabilising racialism. Respectabilising racialism. Racialism being essentially racism, um, and they are trying to make that a respectable political ideology mindset. Yep, that's what um, you know Martin Webster is trying to do. He is also, and I think it was quite insidious, a term of this kind of like psychological welfare of making immigrants sh- know that they are not welcome by the National Front in in Britain. Um, and I always used to think, like, what's the purpose of, like, National Front or, like, BNP in more recent times, or, um, what's that other group called, or whatever they're all called, um, the other one, um, led by Tommy Robinson, or whatever his real name is, um, yeah, I always thought, like, what is actually the point, like, why are you protesting, like, who cares, like, why, why are you here, like, that wouldn't have an impact, shouldn't have an impact on people, but, Actually, when you think about it, um, Britain in the 1970s, um, the police are still extremely hostile. The British state is still passing anti-immigrant bills. um, And, you know, the British state is still hostile to black and brown people in Britain. Um, And so you've got that kind of weighing on your mind. You've got housing issues, employment issues, schooling issues, which are coming to the fore in the 1970s. And on top of that, you've got this group that are literally marching against your very like existence and way of life in in britain and by the 70s you know some people would have been there from the early 50s that's like a good 30 years nearly um and have settled had settled sorry in britain in various parts especially in southeast london which was a very um, multicultural part of london and still is to this day um those exact areas you can you can see a variety of literally food shops, um, you know, groceries, people even, um, from all walks of life um, in areas like South East London. So the fact that, you know, they were marching and had planned to march to psychologically impact immigrants to make them know that they were not welcome, I think is quite insidious and, and very brutal um, in a way that's different to, like, you know, overt violence on the street or name calling. This is like people actually took time out of their day to organise um, and march literally against black and brown people and just the fact that they were existing. And now we have a second clip um, about Martin Webster um, and kind of some of the things he has said and was thinking about um, his work within the... On the extreme right, Martin Webster the Front's national activities organiser and the man best able to put across the Front's respectable image. But he is being quoted as saying, we are busy forming a well-oiled Nazi machine in this country. And we have a second clip um, about a man called John Tyndall, who was chairman of the um, National Front Party, or whatever it was known as. Um, and this is John Tyndall, chairman. Formerly a member of the National Socialist Party, modelled on Hitler's Nazi Party, and an organiser of an illegal military body he called Spearhead. Right, so you heard there, um, a lot of affinity and allegiance and links with the Nazi Party, which can never be a good thing, um, because I think we all know what they stood for and what Hitler stood for and how that ended. 
Um, so I think this kind of neo-Nazi approach to race relations and what they would call as racial problems in Britain um, is very scary. It's very violent. And the fact that, you know, you've got people like John Tyndall who are, you know, part of these like military, paramilitary organisations, um, it's quite concerning, I think, um, to think then that these would be the people marching on the streets on the 13th of August 1977. Um, and I just wanted to kind of set the scene. And it's not like I wanted to give power and voice to the National Front of the past and kind of hear, you know, let them have a platform on this podcast. Obviously not, they're not literally here. But um, I think it's important because sometimes we just think of these like groups of people as like a big blob of people that all just share some views that aren't really very nice and, and we don't really agree with but these are individual people that would influence their families that would influence their friends that would influence their co-workers potentially their children you know they would send their kids to school following dinner table conversations of this nature and so I think you know think about the influence one person can have on on its street on its society within their family their friends um I think it's important to understand the mindset of some of these people and how quickly views like this can spread um and how so you might be thinking right you've got the national front they were founded in 1967 so 10 years prior to this they're a kind of amalgamation of different groups bmp british national party and then the league of empire loyalists um and i will say that by the 1970s um the National Front are increasing their popularity um, and they are actually gaining even votes in like by-elections in Deptford. Um, and this information I'm getting is taken from the Goldsmiths um, site on the Battle of Lewisham because um, if you know South East London, the Goldsmiths campus, or one of them, I think, um, is on New Cross Road. So, you know, in the heart of South East London, um, and they have a lot of information on this sort of thing um, in their archives and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, the National Front and the National Party gained 44% of the votes in a parliamentary by-election in Deptford. So you can see um, it's an area of um, unemployment, high unemployment, high levels of poverty, poor housing conditions, um, poor kind of educational outputs for people. And so in the kind of times of poverty and times of all things are looking tough especially for these white working class people they kind of had to find a scapegoat to pin their problems on and that was immigrants and a lack of control on immigration and the fact that these people were stealing the jobs stealing the houses stealing the school places stealing their women and everything else um and so unfortunately the support for movements like this is growing um, especially in areas of like southeast london where there is poverty um, at the time and it's interesting because there's like poverty and depravity and it's not a great time for many people living in South East London, black, white or otherwise. But it's the fact that white people and not all white people, of course, um, this kind of specific group turn on the people that are coming as immigrants um, and blame it on them, essentially, not the state, not the government um, for not providing for its people, but for to immigrants who have come for a better life or to do a job or whatever. Um, it's their fault, essentially. Um, and so you might be thinking, well, why Lewisham? You know, obviously we've seen they've gotten 44% of the votes in this by-election. But why is it that these people want to do this protest and march in Lewisham? Well, that's an interesting one. And we've got to look at the context. So why Lewisham? Well, they were taking advantage of um, some recent arrests of black young people in the area. The Lewisham 24 um, is what they were known as. Um, and it was a situation where there was obvious over-policing um, in the community and an overuse of surveillance. Um, and it also actually led to a march. Um, the community organised a march in support of the Lewisham 24 um, for the kind of, you know, overzealous policing as well. It's not uncommon to see marches against overzealous police force, especially in London, London Metropolitan Police. And it actually led um, to the National Front um, attacking that march um, that was going on to protest the arrests. And they were arrested there, um, quite a few National Front members. And that was July 23rd. 
so just a few weeks prior to the Battle of Lucia, um, but this kind of sets the tone for it. The racial tensions were already so high, selecting Lucia was adding to that. The National Front knew exactly what they were doing. Martin Webster in the National Front press conference said, we intend to destroy race relations here. It was very deliberate. Um, it was a deliberate location because, you know, black communities, brown communities, anti-racist communities were very much aware of the overzealous policing um, and the disproportionate arrests of young black people, especially boys um, and men at the time. And they were quite, you know, upset about that. The Lusium 24, it was like, I mean, if social media was around, it would have been a trending topic. It was what was on the lips of people. It's what people were thinking about, speaking about and upset about. Um, but the National Front pounced on this idea um, and decide that they will be doing their march um, in Lewisham, in the South East London area, um, so they can, and I quote again, in destroy race relations here. So the National Front had obviously decided that they were going to do this march um, in order to, you know, create more tension um, following on from a protest in, that was done peacefully um, in defence of the people that had been arrested. These arrests were made... Um, in regards to muggings, there was a series of muggings um, and the um, people that were arrested were said to be um, like part of a gang that were responsible. Um, and they, I quote, for 90% of the street crime in South London over the past six months. Um, and that was in the Times. So, you know, everyone was like, well, not everybody, you know, the people that I guess maybe believed in, in the police and the justice system being upheld by those arrests. Were, were fine with that, um, whereas obviously people within the community, um, anti-racist organisations, justice organisations, were protesting peacefully um, against those arrests which they believed to be, um, you know, based on like hyper-surveillance um, and prejudice and racism. Um, so, following that, the National Front announced the plans for their march um, in order to destroy this multiracial society that they saw happening um, they wanted to obviously do it in Lewisham, but local church leaders, Lewisham Council, um, and the Liberal Party actually called for it to be banned. But Metropolitan Police Commissioner at the time, David McNee, he declined to like pass that on to the Home Secretary to to make an application, um, for a ban to you know be put in place, um, because he believed that it would lead to like a kind of chain reaction of of like similar events being banned, um any kind of protest of, of kind of that nature so he didn't want to do that and I mean is it a f big thing to say that maybe there were links with the National Front and the police I am not saying that but um I think some of the way these marches and protests like pan out like it might be a link to make I'm not making that link though I'm just putting those two next to each other that's all um don't come for me please <laughs> But anyway, um, you know, there was pressure on the police, um, on the Met, to stop this protest from happening, but that did not um, happen. So they, people within the community decided that they would do a kind of counter-protest. Now, the National Front's protest was planned to be at 3.30 in the afternoon. So this counter-protest was going to happen in the morning, and organisers were kind of of the view that, you know, we want to show this South London community that, there is an alternative narrative to what's going to be peddled out at 3.30. Um, this anti-racism is not the only way, essentially, and really speak for the actual majority of South East London in their opinions about immigration, because let's be honest, the majority of South East London, like whether it was, you know, majority um, immigrant communities, which it wasn't at that time, was still not racist. Um, it, was a, it was a select group. Now, we can say, um, you know, institutions might be racist and um different like parts of government and authorities but within that kind of area i wouldn't think it was wise or like accurate to say oh everyone was racist because when you actually look at the protests that occurred and the groups that kind of planned it um you know it wasn't just black people brown people marching it was white people it was white anti-racist groups um from a kind of wide range of political um ideologies it was um priests it was um people from local churches the council the mayor um, that were kind of coming out so it was quite um, I think nice I think to see a protest look like that in a sense of it was actually not just black people having to fight for their rights but actually um, you know other 
other groups standing up and saying this is actually wrong, this is not a representation of our area, of our streets. So it was the um, All Lewisham Campaign Against Racism and Fascism, which is like shortened into Alcaraf. Um, that's a kind of, I think it might be the A-L-C-A-R-A-F, but Alcaraf sounds better. Um, and they organised and led the march um, from Lady Wellfields to New Cross. Well, that was a plan anyway. Um, and it like had members of socialist and communist organisations, the council um, and lots of religious organisations. There were like ministers on the march that were like giving speeches and stuff. Um, they wanted the demonstration, the National Front demonstration to be banned um, and were adamant then that all counter demonstrations to that National Front protest were peaceful. Um, they really wanted like a nice peaceful kind of show of, um, you know, protest against the National Front. Um, and then you've got the Anti-Racist, Anti-Fascist Coordinating Committee, the A-R-A-F-C-C, um, and they supported Alcaraf March. And they assembled along part of the route um, that was planned out for Alcaraf to take. Um, and all routes like were planned in advance with the police. The police were the ones that were coordinating both marches to make sure that they didn't clash and the one finished up on time so that the one National Front one could start at 3.30 and there wouldn't be any, like, clashing of protesters because, like, that was a whole plan. That was not meant to happen, basically. OK, so at um, around 11.30, the Alcaraf demonstration gathered in Ladywell Fields, um, which is a park in Ladywell. Um, and over 5,000 people from, like, 80 different organisations heard speeches. The Mayor of Lewisham spoke, the Bishop of Suffolk, um, Bishop, an exiled Bishop of Namibia, um, and lots of other speakers from, like, different political organisations. Um, but the kind of agreement with the police that the al march would stop at the top of a loom pit veil between Lewisham and New Cross, um, that was what the agreement was. But stewards um, for the anti-racist, anti-fascist coordinating committee, um, they actually encouraged marchers to like go with them, do like a back street. Um, and so then people from that Alcaraf march got onto like New Cross Road, which um, the police had like deliberately said, you are not allowed to go onto New Cross Road, um, which was actually not what Alcaraf wanted. Um, and they got onto the route of the uh, National Front March, um, and then other protesters who were mobilised by um, the Socialist Workers' Party had gathered on Clifton Rise, which was another side street off New Cross Road. Um, the police actually contained them there, um, so they were unable to get onto the main road, but other people did actually get onto the main road, and this is where the clashes began. So, as you can imagine, there were clashes. Um, Anti-fascists, National Front, they kind of ended up in the same place, um, which is what the police desperately didn't want. Um, and this led to violent clashes. Um, the marchers were pelted with bricks, smoke bombs, bottles, pieces of wood. Um, the anti-National Front demonstrators got away from, like, police lines and kind of attacked the back of the National Front march, um, and that kind of, like, broke up the National Front march. Um, and they also, like, took the National Front banners and burnt them. A lot of the banners were saying things like... Um, making reference to those um, people that were arrested, saying things like stop the muggers, um, because obviously they were arrested for a series of muggings that took place in South London. Um, and so eventually the police kind of got involved and there's like conflicting evidence of whether it was actually the police um, and their kind of overzealous and violent behaviour that led to like heightened clashes um, and, you know, the kind of big spout of violence that's kind of known as the battle, shall we say. Um, but these clashes continued. Um, and eventually, like, the police kind of re tailed off, like, most of the National Front protesters. So there's actually quite a high number of anti-National Front protesters from, obviously, all the different organisations and groups. Um, but, yeah, the clashes continued between the police and the counter-demonstration groups um, because they didn't realise, and not the police, sorry, the anti like national front groups didn't really realize that the national front had been escorted out the area and like cordoned off and put onto trains to kind of go back to wherever um you know whatever part of London they came from um this was actually the first time that the police brought out riot shields for use on British mainland um they used like mounted police and baton charges to disperse the crowd bricks and bottles were thrown at the police and lots of police vehicles were damaged um there was a point in time, um, it's been reported, where like the police completely lost control of the centre of Lewisham um, by the clock tower. 
um, and this kind of breakdown was like due to like a breakdown in police command um, and that led to kind of I guess a little window of opportunity for anti-national front protesters um, there was also like a few instances of looting of shops and a vehicle set on fire before the police managed to gain control of the area so that was kind of it for the clash it wasn't like a battle as I said I think battle was the wrong term but I understand the Battle of Lucian does sound like it could be a film. Um, 111 people were injured and I think it's around 214 people were arrested during these clashes. Um, so, you know, it was it was quite an eventful day for for the National Front, for anti-fascism, anti-racism and for the police um, and for South East London that day. Um, and that is the Battle of Lucian in its most simple terms. So thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you have a wonderful week. Um, And if you have not listened to any episodes before this, then please go back, have a listen and enjoy. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the History Hotline. If you've enjoyed this episode, please tell a friend to tell a friend. To continue the conversation about black history, head over to our social media platforms at the History Hotline on Instagram and at the History HL on Twitter.